there and welcome back to another review. Today we're going to be able to look at Star Trek 3, uh, The Search for Spock. Um, still quite a few obviously Star Trek movies to get through but I'll be doing them in order following on from uh, my previous Star Trek movie, uh, Star Trek 2 Wrath of Khan. Uh, this one being made in 1984 and directed by Leonard Nimoy. Obviously due to the success of um, Wrath of Khan uh, there was always going to be a sequel was almost pretty much on the cards um, due to the success of that movie. They did pretty much leave it open at the end um, sort of you know I think maybe seeing how the film goes seeing if it's successful and that would obviously lead uh, to a third movie um, with the idea of like bringing Spock back I mean if they didn't do that I think there would have been like a complete uproar um, as I mentioned um, with the Star Trek 2 review that you know Leonard Nimoy even receiving death threats and some people in production actually receiving death threats um, in like regards to the Spock's character and like killing him off um, so to say, a third movie where where Wrath of Khan was successful, and that many consider that to be sort of um, the first film uh, in the Star Trek classic series that we should have got compared to sort of the motion picture. Um, a third film was going to happen, and Len Leonard Nimoy had such a blast on Star Trek Two that he wanted to do another one, even going as I say so far as to direct this one and the Voyage Home as well. Um, I did read as well that the way they went about this movie is quite interesting. They actually worked backwards in terms of like the story and the narrative. They had already come up with like some of the ideas uh, in terms of like the destruction of the Enterprise and um, the scene with Spock remembering who Jim Kirk is at the end. They sort of had these ideas in place, um, these sort of scenes they wanted to show, and they sort of worked backwards in regards to sort of right how can we get to that bit, how can we get to this bit. So they sort of had in their idea the basic outline for what they wanted to show uh, the audience and what the story was you know what was going to happen in the story um you know the whole idea of bringing spot back because let's face it if, if they didn't you know fans would have been absolutely mortified so they had to you know they had to bring spot back um, in many ways the film is based on that idea of friendship and what you are willing to do for someone you care about and also the idea and themes of resurrection and life after death so getting into almost sort of biblical sort of themes here in regards to like I say sort of um, resurrection and um, things like that and uh, sort of um, moving into that sort of territory here um, I may be in the minority as well and I know many view too as sort of the best Star Trek movie a lot of people I mean it's all subjective I know I mean we all have our favorite um, films in series and franchises don't we but um, I think in many ways but I actually think Search for Spock is a lot more entertaining as a whole um, dare I say and that's like I said this isn't to take anything away from Wrath of Khan but I just think overall Search for Spock is a lot more um, I just think the pacing of it is a lot better. I think it's a lot more easy and relaxed to watch, whereas Khan is sort of tense all the way through. I mean, I enjoy both movies. I just think this movie is a lot, as I say, better pace. It does slow down at times, allowing the audience to just take in and enjoy what's going on. Um, but partly due to like Leonard Nimoy being familiar with the actors, Leonard Nimoy being behind the camera, obviously much more of a relaxed atmosphere where they all sort of knew each other. They've known each other for so many years now. They've worked together all this time. So I think Search for Spock is... I wouldn't say it's a, like a casual film, but it's it's sort of, um, it, like I say, where Khan is sort of from beginning to end, sort of straight up, sort of tense thriller. Search for Spock is more of, um, you know, there is danger and there are antagonists in this movie, but it is a lot more sort of just enjoy it, enjoy being part of, like enjoying the Star Trek crew, enjoying watching Jim do, go out of his way to do what he can to bring Spock back for his beloved friend. Um, and I say, I think overall it's just a little bit more just relaxed and easier to watch. But I, I, may, I still enjoy Wrath of Khan. I just think Search for Spock to me is just maybe, personally, I just maybe prefer it a little bit more uh, than Star Trek 2. So the film opens with a flashback of Spock's death from the previous movie, which I assume was mainly just shown to sort of um, get across to people who haven't seen Star Trek 2, just familiar with sort of what's happened and, you know, the story so far and um, just setting up, you know, the basic plot outline for how the film begins. Um, like we see Spock's casket on the Genesis planet where it was left at the end of the previous movie. Fantastic score in this as well. Um, fantastic music from James Horner. What I like about this movie is that it picks up immediately after Star Trek Two ends. It's like it doesn't cut to something else. It doesn't go forward like a year or so. It doesn't go forward um, like several months after. It picks up literally immediately 
after Star Trek Two finishes, which I think is a great, great idea. Like this, this is a continuation of Star Trek Two. Um, as I say, this arc, um, this story arc continues as well in Star Trek Four: The Voyage Home. So I, that's why I, I do like that as well. Like so, so Kirk is still when we meet Kirk. There's been no time for him to grieve and sort of really even come to terms with the loss of Spock. He, you are like you you meet Kirk at the beginning of this movie and he is still sort of reading from what happened. He is still, they are still sort of, um, sort of beaten and sort of shattered and exhausted from the end of the last movie, which is, as I say, is a very, um, fantastic way to sort of start the movie. It's like, right, let's pick up exactly where we were. Let's keep the story going. Let's keep the momentum going. Let's not set it a year down the line or anything like that. Like this is happening right now, immediately after. Um, so to say, he's still grieving for the loss of Spock and still mourning the loss of his friend and he's taking the Enterprise home. So we meet Krug, who is like this evil Klingon played wonderfully by Christopher Lloyd, uh, who gets information on Genesis. We get informed that Savick, um, not played by Kirstie Alley this time round, and Kirk's son David are investigating the planet, uh, like the Genesis planet, and um, find Spock's tube uh, on the planet. So Kirk finds Bones in Spock's quarters, who is like talking like Spock. He's like, there's something up with Bones. Like he starts to sound like Spock. There's, they, you think, what's going on? Like, because Bones is sort of having a complete, um, sort of meltdown in his brain because he's, you, Sp Bones isn't right. Basically, Bones is not a hundred percent just Doctor McCoy at this point. Um, same things like you know why didn't you bring me home why didn't you you know there's when he finds him in the, his quarters um why did you leave me on genesis and things like that so you get an impression like what you know what's what's going on here like what what why is bones talking like that we then find out the enterprise is not going to be repaired and the genesis is like the whole genesis program like on earth and within the federation is a bit of a taboo subject in regards to starfleet and there has been like political fallout due to the like the nature of the device um <coughs> and so Sarek, um, Spock's father, shows up at Jim's place and basically tells the rest of the Enterprise crew who are there at that point to just do one. He tells them to basically, look, I'll talk to you, Jim, and you alone. They all say hello to him, but he's like, look, I ain't got time for this. You know, I've got business with Kirk here. Can you all please just leave? Like, Sarek's not taking... He's not wasting any time. Sarek needs to talk to Jim. Um, he asks him, why didn't you bring him to Vulcan? And that Spock trusted him with this, with his very essence and his catra. I mean, talk about a guilt trip here. Talk about a complete guilt trip just laying it onto Jim, uh, onto Kirk about, you know, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do it? I mean, Jim's hurting here as well. Uh, Jim is still, like I say, he's still grieving. He's still mourning for Spock. And Sarah's like, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? This isn't what Spock wanted. I mean, you know, just layering it, layering it on, piling the guilt on uh, Kirk here at this point. Sarah joins Jim's mind and doesn't find what he is looking for there. And then you have my favourite line in the movie. It's a wonderful scene, uh, this, between Sarek and Kirk, because it's mainly shot all in close-ups, and you really do get that sense of intimacy um, of these two when he sort of um, reads um, Kirk's mind and just go into his thoughts and what's going on. And I just love the bit where Sarek says, everything he was, everything he knew, is lost. Um, and it really does up the... St with that line... Just that line alone, it's like, you know, everything he was, everything he knew is gone. Like, we've lost it. And, like, then the, the score, like, um, takes over that scene as well at that point. And it just is, it really does up the stakes a little bit. It's like, you you really do feel, no, look, that, that can't, you know, we can't, you know, you can't lose Spock. Something's got to be done. Something has to, there has to be a way. There has to be a way to sort of salvage this, to make this right. Um I do like I said, I do like this moment. Shot with, like I say, lots of close up, and as it just has that emotional weight there between Sarek and Kirk. Um, so Kirk finds out that Spock transferred his spirits, like his spirit, as such to McCoy, and is tasked with bringing them both to Vulcan. I mean, that is the basically the gist of the film. He's just got to get um, McCoy and Spock's sort of, um, you know, his body, because his spirit's one place, the body's the other, and he just has to get them together at Vulcan. That is basically just Kirk's mission uh, throughout this movie. Um, as I say, the film is a lot more straightforward. Get Bones, get Spock, bring them here, simple. You know, that's what I like about this film, because it is a bit more relaxed. You don't need to sort of keep up with uh, necessarily what's going on. I'm not saying Wrath of Khan was really complicated by any stretch of the imagination, but this film is just a little bit um, more relaxed and a bit it has a bit more heart to it in terms of, like I say, the relation, what Jim is willing to do for Spock, for his friend. Um, 
Of course, Jim wants the Enterprise, and they're like, no, Jim, so he just takes it anyway. Jim being the road that he is, just going for it, just to hell with protocol. You know, I'm taking the Enterprise. It's my ship. I don't care what you say. Um, then we see McCoy trying to, like, charter a transport with this, like, Yoda-speaking guy, um, sort of talking backwards and words back to front, and he sort of gets arrested. Bones gets arrested, and Jim finds him. And I love Bones saying, like... When he finds out um, what's happened, he says, um, that green-blooded son of a bitch, he has done this to get payback for me for all them arguments he lost. And I love that even though, like I say, they've lost Spock, but McCoy's like, he's only done this just to get back at me, just for like all the time he's lost an argument with me. That's why he's done this, just just to mess with me. This is how sort of McCoy uh, sort of interprets it in his way. But of course he does care for Spock, but it's just McCoy uh, being McCoy. Um, little lines that like that that just make the whole film a lot more light-hearted, which I think works, as I mentioned, in its favour. So they break McCoy out and they take the Enterprise. I never really understood. I uh, will just get, I'll say, like I've said in previous Star Trek movie reviews, that I'm not a Trekkie by any sense. You know, I'm not a hardcore Star Trek fan. I just enjoy some of the series and some of the films just for what they are. I'm not exactly brushed up fully on the lore and things like that. I'm not like a what you would call a complete nerd for it, but I am a fan um, of Star Trek, especially the classic movies. And I've never really understood if they can take something as big as the Enterprise with just five of them, like they're doing this movie, why in other times do they need like a full crew, like a crew of like 50, 40 people, if they can just fly it with five people? I'm not too sure when the whole Enterprise is loaded up with loads of staff and workers, what all these other people are doing. I'm not too sure. Maybe I'm missing something, but if you can fly... I mean, all the are they all the other workers just pressing dials and switches? I mean, what is their role on the Enterprise when it's fully manned and everything? But in here, it's just like five of them taking the Enterprise out. Um, you know, maybe some dive fans out there can explain that to me. But uh, so, <coughs> a more suit up starship, a Starfleet ship called the Excelsior goes after them. Um, it's worth mentioning this ship. You will see Miguel Ferrer, uh, most notable uh, from RoboCop fame, as the villain in that. Um, he's here like very briefly, uh, very briefly like blink and you miss him. But he's sort of one of the people uh, on the Excelsior, um, <coughs> which doesn't get far as sort of Scotty has sabotaged it. We find out the Genesis effects has sort of, sort of regenerated Spock, and the Klingons turn turn up. And David has used proto matter in the creation of Genesis, which basically just speeds everything up. But it's very dangerous, including the planet's lifespan and Spock's age. Not really explained in this film what happened to Carol Marcus. Um, as I say, David, he's here, but it's not really explained what happened to Carol at this point. I think maybe Kurt might mention her earlier in the film. Um, but I'm not too sure. Again, some of you might be able to point it out to me, but I'm not too sure where Carol Marcus has disappeared to. Um, <coughs> so the ship... Um, so the ship David and Savak were on the Grissom gets destroyed by Krug and we have a scene where the Klingon ship the Bird of Prey is sort of in cloak mode and Kirk and Krug seem to have the upper hand until Krug says he will kill one of the hostages on the planet unfortunately with this scene they kill off David which is um, you know I'm sort of skipping through the plot here quite quickly but they kill off David and it's done not in the most dramatic of ways um, it's done so quickly and they kill him so easily that it loses all sort of sense of um sort of emotion it loses that uh, that dramatic effect and it just it just felt david's death just felt so rushed it felt so sort of just thrown in there um i know like i say kirk is upset about it but he does it's like he meets his son in the second films and at the end it ends with that you know i'm proud that you're my dad and in this film they just bump david off so it's just he's gone that's it you know kirk's has a son now he doesn't and that's the end of David. I just think they just slipped the book, like slipped up a little bit there. I think they dropped the ball a little bit. And just in terms of the way it was done, I think it could have been done a bit more dramatically. Um, the way they, like I say, killed David off. Um, so the Klingons go to board the Enterprise, unaware that Kirk, Scotty, and Chekhov have activated the destruct sequence. They beam down to the planet. Kirk Law's crew by saying, I have the secrets of the Genesis. What I like here is that at least you get to see um the two the antagonist and the protagonist, you actually get to see them face to face. They do share the same scene. They have a, like a fight as well at the end of the movie. It's a more, like I say, a physical showdown rather than just sort of on, uh, you know, uh, spaceships and um, things like that. Because like with Kirk um, and Khan in Star Trek 2, they never actually shared a scene together. That's one of the problems I had with that film. Although I love Wrath of Khan to pieces. 
that there wasn't ever a scene where they're on the same screen together they're in the same space together so, so here with this film uh, with Christopher Lloyd Lloyd's character they more than make up for that they they give that um there is the odd moment of like questionable delivery by Shatner with even saying like I've had enough of you when he just sort of kicks crew off like the cliff uh, so he kills him, basically gets his device, speaks Klingon, and they get sort of beamed up where the rest of the Enterprise crew are on the Vulcan uh, ship. And they go off to, um, not Vulcan, sorry, on the Klingon ship. And they go off to Vulcan with Kirk just simply saying, goodbye, David. And that's it. Like, that, you know, he's he's lost Spock, then he's lost his son, but he's more concerned with saving Spock. Um, you know, couldn't save David, but he just he just says goodbye, David. And that's it. Like, he, he gets over it so quickly, maybe because... That's Kirk just being the hard, you know, hard emotional guy he is. Maybe it's because he only knew his son briefly. Maybe he just wasn't that, you know, didn't get to know him. Therefore, the emotion wasn't there. Um, I don't know. But it's just like I say, with the whole David death thing, I do think they slipped up a little bit there and just the way it was done and the way it was handled. Um, just loses all effect there, I feel. So Spock is now Leonard Nimoy. Um, obviously, this film was a great chance where Spock Bock him like as Leonard Nimoy is not in the bulk of the movie, so it just enabled him to focus on directing and you know getting the film done, shooting the film. So Bones admits he has missed Spock at this point, or Uhura is already there on Vulcan on Vulcan. So they inform McCoy there is a great risk as you have Spock's mind, and he says, I choose the danger, proving even then that what McCoy is willing to do for Spock as well, despite all their differences and their arguments and how much, you know, sort of sometimes they butt heads a lot. It's you know, McCoy's willing to do what he needs to do to bring Spock back. Um you know, he's he's more he chooses the like the danger. I mean, this film, Kirk has lost his ship, his son, a guy. You know, he's gone through a lot. You know, Kirk in this movie, he really has he lost a lot, and he's sacrificed a lot to get where he is. You know, he's gone against protocol. He's lost his ship. He's lost his son, all in the name of just getting Spock back. And like I said earlier, you know, in the start of the review, it's very much just about what you are willing to do, um, for that somebody you care about, for that special somebody that really does mean a lot to you and you will go to the end of the earth for. Um, so Spock's spirit is sort of reunited with his body, goes to walk away and turns back in his robe and then he walks amongst the crew, which is a really lovely scene of them all smiling at him like, you know, Spock is back and, you know, he's here, we've got him. Um, I love how he says, why would you save me? Um, there's a beautiful bit of dialogue where a very, you know, very clever script writing here where he says, why would you save me? I don't understand. Why would you do all this? And he says, because the needs of the one outweigh the needs of the many. Um, sort of playing on that, you know, of the famous quote from the previous movie. Um, just explaining how much Spock means to him. And he remember, at the end, he does remember Jim's name. Um, and that's sort, sort of, as I mentioned, that's sort of what they built up from they built from that scene and then sort of work backwards in terms of the script um but that sort of wraps up the review really as i said <clears throat> a lot more a lot more um sort of heart in this movie like i said the only thing that lets it down i think is just sort of the way david's death is handled but overall the film just like i said christopher lloyd fantastic performance here that notion of um, sacrifice and you know what you're willing to do for the special somebody and in my like in my eyes it's just as good as Wrath of Khan it, I think personally I enjoy this film as I mentioned maybe just a little bit more um, not to take anything away from Star Trek 2 at all and it's still a brilliant movie and I love that movie but Star Trek 3 for me is just a lot more you can tell like I said with Leonard Nimoy behind the camera it's just there was a lot more more of a relaxed atmosphere and like I say it's a lot easier to follow and it's just it just flows really nicely this movie and it's just a really really enjoyable ride so thank you very much for watching um hope you enjoyed the review I will try and get round to Star Trek 4 The Voyage Home as soon as I can uh, but in the meantime hope you're all good out there and I'll see you soon <laughs>